So we're going to kind of jump into that right now. And I'm going to go ahead and, and go live and, and talk about that. I want to kind of to jump into that because that becomes something that becomes significant. I think that we can talk about a little bit. So as I start to, to talk about this and to, and to really think about just the whole impact of the timeline. And we were talking a lot about ancient history over the last couple of sessions, talking about, you know, just even the Holocene period where we're in geologically and geological time and how the, the geology of an area changes places and it impacts places. And that becomes a very significant point when you want to study the Nile Valley and ancient Nubia. So I want to kind of jump into it now and why it becomes a point because the, the manner in which people move is, is very significant, is important. So I want to kind of throw up a map here and kind of just really talk about and give a definition of what Nubia is and what we've talked about Nubia in terms of like a, a definition, if you will. When we talk about the Nile Valley, obviously the Nile, the River Nile is the central point of that. It's the central focal point. And from about 3800, 3100 BC up until you know, even today, the Nile is, is very significant. It becomes a central focal point for people living in that area of Africa. But when you think about it, you know, when you when you really define what, what Nubia was and what ancient Kemet was, it was really a gathering around the Nile. And one of the reasons they gathered around the Nile was because of the desert. You know, you're living in a desert, you're in a place that's very dry, the desertification has taken place over a, a long period of time, and people begin to move closer and closer into the Nile. But that wasn't always the case. So when you really start to define Nubia and you define Kush and, and ancient Kemet and various people in lower Nubia, you start to find societies that develop that congregated right along the Nile. And you're really talking about a narrow stretch of land. We're not talking about a wide, wide area. We're talking about a narrow stretch of land where people, as you can kind of see depicted in this map here, where people are are gathering to find water, to bring, you know, water and nourishment to their, to their animals, to their domesticated animals so that they can survive, to be able to continue their agriculture so that they can eat. And you find uh, a need for them to even coordinate more. And there's things that are happening in the Nile or things that are happening in the Nile, like, like cataracts, rocky areas in the Nile where you can't move freely with a boat up and down as freely as you could if you had no cataracts. So the cataracts make it difficult to move. And you can see that right here in, in, in ancient Egypt, the first cataract was the was the southern border of ancient Kemet in historical speak. It was its southern border. And as you go start going down from between the first cataract and what is the, the border of modern day Sudan, right there around the second cataract, that's lower Nubia. That's where lower Nubia is. And as you go from the second cataract, you hit the third cataract, you start seeing Kerma and the kingdoms of Kush and, and various places like that. The fourth cataract, fifth cataract, you get to Meroe and you start getting to where the white and the blue Niles meet right there and Khartoum. And so this whole area becomes a significant area as the as the, the Sahara Desert grows, right? As it can and then the area starts to dry out, people gather around the Nile. But the important point I want to make here is that we're not just talking about gathering around and it didn't just happen with respect to gathering around the Nile. It wasn't always dry. <laughs> the area wasn't always like that. And as we start to really kind of kind of take a look at that and we talk about the area that is Napta Playa, I want to kind of draw the attention just to the, the map that's right above me here. And you can see kind of yellow, um, kind of put it here. And this is the area where you would see the, the, um, the whole Nubian area here you would see in, in the Northeast part. You will find that, you know, some nine, 10,000 years ago, the, the changes in the weather and the changes geologically, there wasn't always this, this dry condition in the area that is now Northeast Africa. You found that what was Sahara the Desert today was a grassland. 9,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, and even you know, later than that, you'll find an area where the Sahara Desert was a grassland. And why is that significant? And why does that impact the Nile Valley, right? It impacts the Nile Valley because you don't have to hug very close to the Nile if you have a grassland. If the area is not completely a desert, you can do more things like graze cattle, raise cattle and have the cattle graze and have the cattle eat. And I've always, I don't know if you've wondered that. I've wondered that even as a child, I wondered why was the cow so significant in ancient Kemet you know, history? And, and, and why are we talking about cows in the desert? I mean, I don't see cows in the desert. And even today, you can find cattle obviously very important in this area. And one of the reasons is because they had a very long history, a very long history of raising cattle and having cattle graze and being able to raise cattle on 
on grassland in what is today the Sahara. And that geological changes, those geological changes and climatic changes really had an impact on what people did. And it begins to speak to a cultural connection between ancient Nubia and the whole Nile Valley. That it's not like the people started, you know, 4,000 BC, let's, let's go back 4,100 BC, a thousand years before ancient Kemet became a country, before it became united, the two yens united, if you will. Let's go back a thousand years before that. It wasn't necessarily like people were just, you know, you know, try, trying to fight in a certain way or trying to ignore themselves in a certain way. This whole area was, and, and Kemet wasn't even started yet. Kush wasn't even really started, even though people were already there and the seeds and the precursors and the ancestors were already there. Trust me, the ancestors were already in the, in the Nile Valley a thousand years before Kemet started, even, even before then. And so it wasn't like they had a distinction between themselves, the way we look at it now, even the way things developed a few thousand years later. But they had a cultural connection up and down now. They had no reason to see themselves as different. They had things and practices, which we'll be talking about today and over the next couple of days, things and practices that they did that helped to develop their culture and laid the seeds for, for the, the civilizations that would come thereafter. And one of the main examples of that and that that cultural connection, if you will, is the area of Napta Playa. And this Napta Playa area is an area that's in what would be considered Nubia. It's in what would be considered today, it's, it's, Kemet, it's, it's Egypt, it's the southern part of Egypt. So it's in what would be considered Nubia. And so if you look right here, where it says Lower Nubia, it is west of Abu Simbel. So it's really right along the border between the Sudan and today's and today's southern Egypt. Now, at the time when before, you know, before Egypt was a country, before Kemet was a country, it wasn't like a country. It was a lot of people there. And we'll talk about the possible states that were there and the possible political organizations that were there as we move forward talking about this in the next couple of days. But one of the things you find is at the time in antiquity, even when ancient Kemet started around 3100 BC, this area of Loba Nubia was not traditionally a part of its borders. You know, at times ancient Kemet went into Lower Nubia, at times ancient Kemet said, hey, we, we control Lower Nubia, we think we control Lower Nubia, we've been doing it all this time. So they've had ideas that they had, but they did not have a significant presence in Lower Nubia the entire time. And that becomes significant because, as I mentioned to you, you know, before Kemet becomes a country, there are people all over this area. There are people all over this area in a wider and a wider band than just those that are hugging the Nile. And even when Kemet starts around 3100 BC, you still have people all around here. You have the Meje and the Uret and the Wawet, and you have various people in Lower Nubia. You have the people of Kush and Yam farther south in, in Upper Nubia. You have the people of Punt who are going toward the Red Sea. You have people all over this area. You have people in Northwestern Africa. You have people all over this area, and obviously in Southern Africa as well, in Western Africa. You have people all over this area. So we, we tend to look at ancient Kemet as if it's like in some type of, in like a bubble. <laughs> like, like somehow it developed in this, and it just came out of nowhere and that somebody came from the north and just dropped in or people say crazy things just dropped in and started the civilization and started the society that was not the case it was a society that grew out of the natural happenings and people that were there already the natural goings on and a lot of that was impacted by by weather and by climate a lot of those things were forced but it was a society that developed out of the natural happenings that were happening already in the Nile Valley so as we start to talk about a little bit about Napta Playa and get a little bit into like what Napta Playa is and, and, and why that's significant and what can we learn about Napta Playa with respect to this, we start to talk a little bit about, you know, what is this place? So as I mentioned, it's in what will be considered Lower Nubia and it is 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 not right along the Nile. It's like uh, at least 100 miles away from the Nile. It is not right by the Nile. It's west of the Nile. So it's not hugging the Nile. And it is something that was developed probably some 5,000 BC or there about some, some you know, six or 7,000 years ago. This was a site, and this was a site in what would be considered Lower Nubia, what would become Lower Nubia, and it was an area where they had, you know, it was about 0.8 miles like wide and like 1.8 miles long. It was kind of a, a, a rectangular-like area, a, a wide area, if you will, and it was a ceremonial site. It was clear that this was a site where people used several things that they developed for probably spiritual purposes, religious purposes, ritual purposes. It was developed here, here in Nubia. And so one of the things you find that they have, not only do they have this cal this calendar circle, but they have these large megalithic structures. They have structures that make, that weigh tons. They had like 10 slabs that were nine feet high in various type of formations. They had 30 rock 
like lined ovals. So you have these these ovals that are there that are 30 of them that are, that are rock lined. They had nine burial sites for cows. So you end up seeing these these burial sites where they have cows in them and they have these huge megalithic stones that they're using for ceremonial purpose. So this is, when you think about that, you know, 5,000 years before Christ, huge megalithic stones, you know, not, there's no one person doing this. It's not, it's not like this is like two or three people setting up these stones in, in, you know, in the desert, in, in what would be the grassland slash becoming desert in, um, in Africa years ago, it's not one or two people. You begin to realize that there must have been a coordinated effort. There must have been a labor force. There must have been people gathered together, societies, people grouped together for doing this. And when they group together, they begin to tell you what's important to them. So one of the things you see in this calendar circle, you see this calendar circle is aligned with several things. It's right around the Tropic of Cancer. And when the 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 summer solstice take place, which is kind of coming up, when the summer solstice takes place, it's an area where the rocks will not cast a shadow. So it was, that was a significant thing. It's still a significant thing for several people. That was a significant thing in ancient times to be able to understand what the summer solstice's longest day of the year is and being able to, to be this because of where they're located, they could have their, their, their structure set up where it would not cast a shadow and probably be a part of a, a ritual that they were, they were doing. One of the structures apparently was also aligned with the heliactal rising of, of Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And we, what that means is there's a certain point of time in the year at this part, in this part of the world, a certain point of time where you can, you cannot, you can like, you know, you won't be able to see Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. It kind of goes away for about a 70 day period. So it goes away for about a 70 day period and then it rises again in the nighttime sky. You can see the brightest star in the sky again and it rises above the horizon and you can see it right at dawn when it kind of is, is reborn. So it, you can't see it for a while for about 70 days in the nighttime sky and then it comes back and it rises again just at dawn and you can begin to see the brightest star in the sky again. And that that's serious. That's why that is significant and why that's connected. That is the same star and, and for maybe some of the same reasons the ancient comedic people kind of base their calendar around. It just, it also happens, and I think it's probably not just happenstance, but it also happens that the rising of, of Sirius again, the reappearance of Sirius again in the, in the sky at this time of the year when it would happen also coincided with the floods that would take place, the yearly floods and the inundation that would take place in the Lyle coming down from Ethiopia, flowing out to the Mediterranean Sea. So that was a significant thing for the Kemetic people, but it was also a significant thing for this site right here, Naptiply. It was also a significant thing for Naptiply as well. So that, that, so you begin to look and see that's a connection there. Then also one of the sites were also apparently aligned with Orion's belt, which was, which you can see if you look at in the constellation of Orion, you see the three stars, Orion's belt. That was also later on associated with a star. And you also have another structure here that was aligned with the, some stars that, that are close enough to the North Pole, close enough to the North Star, if you will, close enough to, to Polaris, where they never set. And so the ancient, Kemetic people eventually would associate pharaohs and their kings, like King Dozier and various pharaohs, with the stars that never set in the sky, stars that never go away, and believing that they would live on forever. So you have these connections with respect to Sirius. You have these connections with respect to, to Orion's belt. You also have a significant connection when it comes to cattle veneration. As I mentioned, there were burial sites in Napta Playa, which would be, become Lower Nubia, burial sites for cows. And as I mentioned, as we think about cows, you know, I wasn't thinking you would have cows in a desert, but it wasn't always a desert. It was a grassland and it becomes a significant respect that they have for cattle. You will find that when you get into to ancient Nubia and you start to get into to Kush, not only do you see similar types of things, you see cattle being very, very much venerated in ancient Kush. When you go and we've talked about Kerma and we'll talk more about Kerma, when you go to the ancient sites of Kerma and you look at the, the kings that were buried, Thousand years after Napta Playa, you know, fifteen hundred years after Napta Playa, even two thousand years after Napta Playa, you see people being buried in Kush in Upper Nubia in Kerma, and they're buried with with many many cattle as a sign of wealth and a sign of veneration for cattle. You see them talking about cattle. They have one uh, king who was, in, I believe, in the middle of classic Kerma that had some four thousand cattle head buried with him as a, as a show of wealth and a show of power. So not only that, you end up finding the comedic people having people like um, Hathor or Hetheru symbolizing a cow being, being something that's a cow. That's not, you know, disrespectful. This is something that was respected. And I was talking about even earlier today, you will find that 
king after king, pharaoh after pharaoh, leader after leader refers to himself as a bull. Like the, the pharaoh was a bull, a mighty bull. And even Bianchi said that, that his mother was a cow who gave birth to a bull. King Bianchi said that. The whole idea of cattle, they were venerated. You even had cattle that were mummified in ancient Kemet. And you can see that type of thing going back as far as Naphtali Playa. We're in the same general area, not far from the Nile Valley, with wider wider societies, if you will, impacting each other, having a veneration for the cow, respecting and remembering Sirius, the, the star Sirius, having respect for Orion's belt, having megalith the structures that they work on, having coordinated communities with respect to that because one person didn't do this, and probably also having a priesthood. You don't have structures like this where you perform rites, where you don't have a priesthood and some type of polity or political structure where these things are happening. So as you start to look at it, it becomes very, very clear and very strong evidence that this whole idea of the Nile Valley and up and down the Nile Valley is not simply just one place or two places like that is not simply just that there's a whole connection and a whole community that's taking place in the Nile Valley. And that becomes important for us to recognize. And, and, you know, it's not like, it's not like ancient Kemet dropped out of nowhere. The 3100 BC, um, the ancient Kemet people started a kingdom and, and, and that was it. And, and they had no predecessors. There were no people in the Nile Valley. There was no connection to the people around them. There was no reason for there to be a connection. That's not, that's not what happened. And so, we talk about it, but that's not what happened. Really, at, at some point in time, when you started to have the drying out accelerate, you know, after 5000 BC, going into 4100 BC, then 3800 BC, and even 3600 BC, you start to see a more rapid de, de drying out, if you will, of this area. And even 3300 BC, it starts to really speed up, according to geologists and scientists. And then you have a period of a couple hundred years, which is a long time for us. A few hundred years is a long time for us, but it's a very short period of time geologically where the drying out really speeds up and you have a need for people to congregate around now and they take all of their customs, all of their beliefs, all the traditions and they go towards water and they share and they become a society and they trade with one another and they are familiar with one another and they know one another and they even bury each other in similar ways and have respect for one another, which we're going to talk about again tomorrow. So I just wanted to share this. I hope you have a good day. Please share more that you might like to talk about downstairs, but I'm down in the, um, in the comments, but I wanted to talk about the cultural continuity and some things we can learn from that apply. And we'll pick up tomorrow and we'll talk more about what does this then mean for, for the societies of about what else do we know about this? And we'll continue to have this conversation. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.